A Christian reporter pulled out Hugh Hefner's heartbreaking secret that kept him from following God. Many people would say that Hugh Hefner is the godfather, the pioneer, the thought leader in the modern day corn adult industry. He started the Playboy empire from a magazine to a mansion and ultimately a lifestyle that he lived until his last days on the earth. But what if all the fame and the women and money wasn't all it was cracked up to be? What if he actually had a secret that led to him starting this massive empire and at the same time prevented him from following God. Even massive celebrities like Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro, who've had the opportunity to live a lifestyle of indulgence, have speculated if at the end of the day, was Hugh Hefner ever really happy? Unless you're Hugh Hefner. I don't know if he, he had a good life or not. I know some people who worked with him near the end. Yeah. He seemed kind of miserable. I mean, well, like, towards the end, I'm sure he's end. miserable. He's an 80-year-old guy hanging out with 20-year-olds. What the f <laughs> do you have to say to these people? I think it's the image of it is way more interesting than the actual act of living that life. Any normal person would come to the similar conclusion that Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro have, that this sort of lifestyle probably isn't everything it's cracked up to be, probably has some complexity to it. But Hugh Hefner actually reveals several secrets to a Christian reporter that he's never shared before. And this has to be covered because this channel exists to encourage, empower, and inspire you to live a life that blesses God. My name is Ruslan and we are on the road to 500,000 subscribers. So if you're not new here or if you are new here, please hit that subscribe button. I'd love to celebrate that with you shortly. Now there's multiple layers to Hugh Hefner's life, but the last secret revealed in this conversation is by far the most shocking one, which turned Hugh Hefner from an average guy to the super villain of adult content himself. But first, let's get a bit into Hugh Hefner's origin story as he encountered this Christian reporter, Karen Covell, that dug beneath the surface to get perspective on who he was as a person. Hired on a television show called Headliners and Legends with Matt Lauer. It was a celebrity profile show, and they were producing one-hour specials on different celebrities. And the executive producer turned to me and a gentleman next to me I had just met named Rick and said, Karen and Rick, I'm going to put you together, and your first assignment is Hugh Hefner. She's jumping in the deep end. Yeah, like, welcome. I was horrified. He started the Playboy magazine, Playboy Channel, Playboy Mansion. He objectified women. There is nobody that you could give me that I am more disinterested in. And I told my husband, I said, I said, pal, I am so bummed. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do Hugh Hefner. And mm. he said, somebody's going to do it. And if you don't do it, somebody else will. So why mm. don't you do it differently? So I thought, okay, I'm going to start praying about how to do this differently. Pause so it. the next- Here's the interviews I've done and I felt like this. Mm. Interviews I didn't want to do that I did and that have led to moments like that. I'm not gonna talk about them publicly, but behind the scenes, you've seen some of the FaceTime calls I get and some of the conversations I get with certain people. Having a conversation and, and, and media can lead to like really ministering to people behind the scenes in like very, very, very tangible, tangible ways. As a content creator, I think this is super duper important. This, this heart posture, right? Today I went back to the office and I walked in and I said, Rick, I have to be honest with you. I do not wanna do Hugh Hefner. And he said, neither do I. And I said, you don't, you're a guy. Why don't you want to do Hugh Hefner? And he said, I just don't want to do it. Last night, I called my pastor. You what? What did he say? He said to me, Rick, if you don't do it, somebody else will. So mm. you better do it and do it differently. That's and crazy said, that both <laughs> her and her coworker got the same word on, you gotta do it differently. And she didn't even know he was Christian either. Yeah, she didn't know he was Christian, yeah. I kind of got excited about that. But then I had to come and tell you today. And I said, my husband said the exact same thing. We better start praying and figuring out how to do this story. Mm. And we thought of an idea suddenly. We thought, you know, let's not tell how he became famous or what he's accomplished. Let's find out why he became who he is. Mm. We all got in a car together. We drove to the mansion. We came in, we set up. He comes in with an entourage. There were bunnies, there were PR people, there were bodyguards. And he was lovely. He was in the smoking jacket that he wore. He must have had a hundred of them in it. So we sat down and Rick started asking the question. And he said, Hef, that's what he wanted us to call him. He said, Hef, what was your life like growing up? And he looked at us and he said, we believed in God, but it wasn't a very loving home. He said, my parents never told my brother or me that they loved us. And that's my a mother really interesting way to answer the question that this, the founder of this magazine, who has a reputation for objectifying women, 
who creates what many of us would rightfully call filth, corn, and you believe in God? My mother had a phobia of germs and she never hugged us or kissed us. I never had contact with my parents. Could you imagine? So sad. That's so sad. Eesh. And they never knew how to show their love. They only did one thing once for me that I remember. They gave me a gift that I loved so much because it was the only thing that reminded me that my parents loved. He said it was a blanket and I called it my bunny blanket because it had little bunny rabbits around the outside of the blanket. He said, I love that blanket. I slept with it. I carried it around during the day. And he said, that meant so much to me. The other thing I wanted, I wanted a puppy. And my mother said, no, I don't want germs in the house. Until he said, I was seven or eight years old and I got a tumor in my ear and we had to have, I had to have surgery. And he said, the doctor told my mother I could lose my hearing. He said, I remember one day standing in the hallway looking at my mom as she was on the phone with her best friend. And her friend was trying to talk her into giving me a puppy. And finally she gave in. He said, he's gonna lose his hearing, give him a puppy. So she went to a pound. She found a, a puppy, brought it home. He said, I loved that puppy so much that I gave him my bunny blanket to sleep. Mm -hmm. It was my, my joy for five days. And then the puppy died. They didn't know that they brought home a sick puppy. And he said, five days later, my mom has someone take the puppy out of the house. And then in front of me, because the puppy was lying on it, she burned my bunny blanket. I mean, my first dog. Uh, I named him Browse, died after a few days. Uh, I had a favorite blanket when I was a kid that had bunny rabbits on it. I called it my bunny blanket. It was my happiness and security blanket. And when I got this dog, I put the blanket in the box with this dog that I loved so much. When the dog died, they had to burn the blanket. So you can, uh, you can get that image of uh, the bunny blanket being burned and uh, then the boy grows up and turns into the man, creates the bunny empire. At the end of the interview, it was silence in the room. And Hef came straight to Rick and me, and he said, that was my favorite interview. I have never had people ask me questions like that. I never get to talk about my childhood. I thought, I can't hate this man, ever. I can feel sorry for him. I can see his broken heart. I can see why he's made his choice, but not because he's a bad person, because he's a broken person. So after the interview, uh, the week later, I wrote him a note and I said, Hep, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to get to know you and to interview you. I said, you have accomplished everything that man has to offer, but I think there's one thing you haven't accomplished. You know a living God, but I don't think you've ever experienced a loving God. And I hope that that can be the last thing you accomplish. And so I put in this letter a book that I, that I think might help in the journey, put it in a package and I sent it to him and I thought that's all I could do. Two weeks later, I get a letter back from him. Hi, Karen, thank you for my favorite interview. And he said, thank you for the book. I look forward to reading it. I do have a faith, but a lot of people don't understand it. And so I just started praying for him, just started praying. Three months later was Christmas. I got him a Bible. I stamped his name on the front. I wrote Merry Christmas and thanks. And I sent it to him. I get a letter back, thanked me for the Bible. Then three months after that, he was speaking at the Television Academy and I wanted to go see him again because I had continued to pray for him. So I brought a friend of mine. We went backstage and I said, I'm so glad to see you. And he, and he turned to my friend, he goes, she did my favorite interview. Mm -hmm. And my friend said, it's so good to meet you. I loved what you had to say. She said, but I think there's one thing you haven't experienced. And he said, what? And she said, Grace. And he looked at her and said, my mother's name was Grace. Shh, shh. And he went silence again. And then people came up and we had to say goodbye and I hugged him. And that was the last time I talked to him. He grew up in a home where he had no love. As a child, he was searching for it. He found something that he, that he loved, his blanket. And then it was taken away from him. He became an adolescent and that mm -hmm. desire that was not fulfilled became a sexual desire. Then he hung on to that and got older and it became a business and he started making money from it and he started being fulfilled with material things. Then he got older and it became an empire and he ended up having everything that man has to. And yet he was never happy. He was never satisfied. He lived an empty life searching for the truth. 
And that reminds me of the devil comes to steal from us and to kill yep. and to destroy us and takes things from us and makes us think that we can fill up with material items and that we can get joy from more money, a bigger house, more power, and it will ultimately continue to make us feel empty. And yet Jesus offers himself to say, I'm the only way you can be completely fulfilled. It's not from material things, it's not from money, it's not from power, it's not from sex. It's not from all those things that we try to fill our lives up with. It's just believing in a loving God who wants the best for you. That experience not only told me the power of prayer, but also told me we can't judge anybody. We have to find out their story. We have to find out why somebody does what they do. If someone's mean to us, I tell people, have an unoffendable heart and find out why that person did that, not what they did or not mm. how they did it. Mm. And you're going to have a whole different perspective then. Now, I love Karen's heart in the way she approached this conversation, really attempting to get to know the why behind Hugh Hefner, humanize him a bit. But there's one part that she left out that was actually revealed by Hugh Hefner himself in his Headliners and Legends interview. He shares a dark plot twist in his life that actually ended up leading him to start the empire that's a cautionary warning for many Christians today. Check this out. Including Hugh Hefner, who attends the University of Illinois, where his girlfriend, Millie Williams, is enrolled. Millie is studying to be a teacher. Hefner aspires to become a publisher and creates a college humor magazine called Shaft. Eventually, Hefner and Millie become engaged, not long after the Kinsey Report is published. Hefner is amazed by its findings, which indicate that Americans have s more often and in more ways than they admit. Still a virgin at 22, Hefner feels left out. Hefner eventually persuaded Millie to um, uh, go all the way, as it was then known, in a hotel room. The thou shalt nots of that period were related to not having intercourse until you got married. Once you had intercourse, it was a no man's land. Now it's fascinating for Hugh Hefner to acknowledge the society was substantially more Christian back then, at least in their standards towards sexuality. Most people were not looking at sex before marriage as a ideal or good thing to have while you were single. So despite him being brought up in a home with these values and despite all of culture and society having these values as well, he decided that he knew better. And he decided that he was smarter than God and smarter than the Christian principles that he had as a child. So he decides to go all the way with his girlfriend at the time, which backfired in his face. When Millie takes an out of town teaching job, Hefner quickly discovers the downside of his fiance's newfound sexual freedom. While she was away, she had an affair. It was the single most devastating experience of my life. Despite his disappointment, Hefner doesn't leave Millie. So Hugh Hefner pressures his girlfriend at the time to quote unquote go all the way, even though that wasn't common. He was a virgin until he was 22. And after she goes all the way with him and he gets what he wants against what society was saying was the norm based on biblical principles, it backfires. She cheats on him. And he says that was the most devastating time in his life. Yet despite that, he goes on to marry her, have kids with her. And as that marriage eventually falls apart, he rises to notoriety in building the Playboy empire. He knew better. Surprisingly, society knew better. Yet he did what he thought was right, which ultimately turned him into a supervillain. And I feel like this may be a cautionary tale for a lot of Christians today. You know the wisdom of God. You know the standards of God. You know God's heart for all types of topics from sexuality to finances. Yet, sometimes you think you're smarter than God. Let me implore you, you're not, I'm not. God's smarter, God's ways are better, and they're ultimately in line for our best interests. So even though Christian values were a bit more pervasive in culture back then, we could still see the fingerprint of God today, even in artists who do not glorify God with their art. So to prove what I'm talking about, check out this video of Billie Eilish, where she let this slip that could almost get her canceled. I'll see you over there, all right? Peace.